Rowan heard none of what transpired between Zimnocrates and Goddard, but he did see the high blade hurl himself into the deep end, creating a cannonball splash that drew everyone's attention. Zenocrates went down and didn't come back up. He sank to the bottom, someone said. It's all that gold. Rowan had no great love of the high blade, but he also didn't want to see the man drown. It wasn't like he fell, he had jumped. And if he had drowned, trapped in his own golden robe, it would have been considered a self-gleaning. Rowan dove into the pool, and so did Tiger, following his lead. They swam to the bottom where Xenocrates was bubbling out his last bit of air. Rowan grabbed the man's heavy, multi-layered robe, tugging it over his head, and both he and Tiger helped lift the high blade up to the surface, where he gasped, coughed, and sputtered. The crowd around them applauded. Now, he didn't look too much like a high blade. He was just a fat man in wet, golden underwear. I guess I must have lost my balance, he said, trying to be jovial about it attempting to put a new spin on what had happened. Maybe others believed it, but Rowan had seen him throwing himself in. There was no confusing that with an accidental fall. Why on earth would he have done that? Wait, said Xenocrates, looking at his right hand. My ring! I'll get it, said Tiger, who was now the party boy of the hour, and dove to the bottom to retrieve it. Chomsky had arrived at the scene, and he and Volta reached down from the pool's edge to haul Xenocrates out of the water. It was as humiliating as could be for the man. He looked like an overstuffed net of fish being hauled onto the deck of a trawler. Goddard wrapped a large towel around the high blade, uncharacteristically sheepish. I truly, truly apologize, said Goddard. It never occurred to me that you might actually drown. That wouldn't have been a good thing for anyone. And then, Rowan realized there was only one reason for Xenocrates to hurl himself into the pool. Because Goddard had ordered him to. Which meant that Goddard had a much stronger hold on the high blade than anyone knew. But how? Can I go now? asked Esme. Of course you can, said Goddard, giving her a kiss on the forehead. Then Esme wandered off, searching for playmates among the children of the stars. Tiger surfaced with the ring. Xenocrates grabbed it from him without as much as a thank you and slipped it on his finger. I tried to get your robe too, but it's just too heavy, said Tiger. We'll get someone with scuba gear to go down there on a treasure drive, quipped Goddard, although they may claim salvage rights. Are you quite finished, said Xenocrates, because I want to leave. Of course, Your Excellency. Then, the high blade of mid America left the pool deck and went back through the house dripping wet, leaving behind whatever dignity he had arrived with. Damn, I should have kissed his ring when I had the chance, Tiger lamented. Immunity, right there in my hands, and I blew it. Once Xenocrates was gone, Goddard called out to the crowd. Anyone who uploads pictures of the high blade Xenocrates in his underwear will be gleaned immediately. And everyone laughed, then stopped when they realized he was not joking in the least. As the party wrapped up, and Scythe Goddard said goodbye to his most important guests. Rowan watched, taking in everything. So I'll see you at the next party, right? Tiger said, breaking his focus. Maybe next time they'll assign me earlier so I'll get to hang for more than just the last day. The fact that Tiger was about as deep as the fountain out front was an irritation to Rowan. Funny, but he had never been too bothered by Tiger's shallow nature before. Perhaps because Rowan hadn't been much different. Sure, he wasn't the thrill seeker Tiger was, but in his own way, Rowan glided on the surface of his life. Who could have known that the ice was so treacherously thin? Now, he was in a place too deep for Tiger to ever understand. Sure, Tiger. Next time. Tiger left with the other professional party people, with whom he seemed to share much more in common now than with Rowan. Rowan wondered if there was anything from his old life he could relate to anymore. Scythe Goddard passed him standing by the entryway. If you're practicing to be a neoclassical statue, I should get you a pedestal, he said. Of course, we already have enough statuary around here without you. Sorry, Your Honor, I was just thinking. Too much of that could be dangerous. 
I was just wondering why the high blade jumped into the pool the way he did. He fell accidentally. He said so himself. No, I saw it, insisted Rowan. He jumped. Well then, how should I know? You'll have to ask him. Although, I don't think bringing up such an embarrassing moment to the high blade will work in your favor. Then, he changed the subject. You seem to be awfully friendly with one of the party boys. Should I invite more of them for you next time? No, no, it's nothing like that, said Roan, blushing in a spite of himself. He's just a friend from home. I see, and you invited him? Roan shook his head. He signed up without me even knowing. If it was up to me, he wouldn't have been here at all. Why not, said Goddard. Your friends are my friends. Rowan didn't respond to that. He never knew whether Goddard was serious or just baiting him. Rowan's silence just made Goddard laugh. Lighten up, boy. It was a party, not the Inquisition. He clapped Rowan on the shoulder and sauntered away. If Rowan had any sense, he would have left it at that. But he didn't. People are saying that Scythe Faraday was killed by another Scythe. Goddard stopped in his tracks and slowly turned back to Rowan. Is that what people are saying? Rowan took a deep breath and shrugged, trying to make it seem like there was nothing, trying to backpedal, but it was too late for that. It's just a rumor. And you think that I might somehow be involved? Are you? asked Rowan. Scythe Goddard stepped closer, seeming to look through Rowan's facade to that dark, frigid place where he now dwelled. What are you accusing me of, boy? Nothing, Your Honor. It's just a question to clear the air. He tried to return the gaze, looking into Goddard's own cold place, but he found it opaque and unfathomable. Consider the air cleared, Goddard said with a sarcastic lightness to his voice. Look around you, Rowan. Do you think for one instant that I would jeopardize all this by breaking the Seventh Commandment to rid the world of a washed-up old guard scythe? Faraday gleaned himself because deep down, he knew it would be the most meaningful act he had ever performed in more than a hundred years. The time for his kind is over, and he knew it. And if your little girlfriend is trying to make a case for foul play, she'd better think twice before accusing me, because I could glean her whole family the day their immunity expires. That would constitute malice, Your Honor, said Rowan with polite resolve. You could be charged with breaking the second commandment. For a moment, Goddard looked ready to carve Rowan up, then and there. But the fire in his eyes was swallowed by that unfathomable depth. Always looking out for me, aren't you? I do my best, Your Honor. Goddard stared at him for a moment more, then said, Tomorrow, you train with pistols against moving targets. You will render all but one of your subjects deadish with a single bullet. Or I will personally, without bias or malice, glean that party boyfriend of yours. What? Was I in any way unclear? No, Your Honor, I... I understand. And the next time you make an accusation, you better be damn sure it's true and not just insulting. Goddard stormed away, letting his robe swell behind him like a cape. But before he was out of earshot, he said, Of course, if I did kill Scythe Faraday, I wouldn't be so stupid as to admit it to you. He's just messing with you. Scythe Volta hung out with Rowan that evening in the game room shooting pool. But I do think you insulted him. I mean, killing another scythe? That never happens. I think maybe it did. Rowan took a shot and missed the ball completely. His head wasn't in it. He couldn't even remember if he was stripes or solids. I think maybe Citra is messing with you too. Have you ever considered that? Volta took his shot, sinking both a striped ball and a solid, which didn't help. Which didn't help Rowan in knowing what he was going for. I mean, look at you. You're a basket case. She's playing head games with you, and you don't even see it. She's not like that, said Rowan, choosing a striped ball and sinking it. Apparently it was the right choice because Volta let him play on. People change, Volta said, especially an apprentice. Being in a scythe apprentice is all about change. Why do you think we even give up our names and never use them again? It's because by the time we were ordained, we're completely different people. Professional gleaners instead of candy-ass kids. She's working you like chewing gum. And I broke her neck, reminded Rowan, 
so I guess we're even. You don't want to be even. You want to go into Winter Conclave with a clear advantage, or at least feeling like you have one. Esme popped in just long enough to say, I play winner, then left. Best argument for losing ever, grumbled Volta. I should take her on my morning runs, Rowan suggested. She could use the exercise. It might get into better shape. True, said Volta, but she comes by her weight naturally. It's genetic. How would you know? And then Rowan got it. It was staring him in the face, but he was too close to see it. No, you're kidding me. Volta shook his head nonchalantly. I have no idea what you're talking about. Xenocrates? It's your shot, said Volta. If it came out that the High Blade had an illegitimate daughter, it would destroy him. He'd be in a serious violation. You know what would be even worse, said Volta? If the daughter that no one knew about got herself gleaned. Rowan ran a dozen things through this new lens. It all made sense now. The way Esme was spared at the food court, the way she was treated, what was it Goddard had said? That she was the most important person he'd meet that day? The key to the future? But she won't get gleaned, Rowan said. Not as long as Xenocrates does whatever Goddard says. Like jump in the deep end of a pool. Volta nodded slowly. Among other things. Rowan took his shot and accidentally sucked the eight ball, ending the game. I win, said Volta. Damn. Now I'll have to play Esme. I am apprenticed to a monster. Scythe Faraday was right. Someone who enjoys killing should never be a scythe. It goes against everything the founders wanted. If this is what the scythe them is turning into, someone has to stop it. But it can't be me, because I think I'm becoming a monster too. Roman looked at what he wrote and carefully, quietly tore the page out, crumpled it, and tossed it into the flames of his bedroom fireplace. Goddard always read his journal. As Rowan's mentor, it was his prerogative to do so. It had taken forever for Rowan to learn how to write his true thoughts, his true feelings. Now he had to learn to hide them again. It was a matter of survival, so he picked up his pen and wrote a new official entry. Journal Entry Today I killed 12 moving targets, using only 12 bullets, and saved the life of my friend. Scythe Goddard sure knows how to motivate someone to do their best. There's no denying that I'm getting better. I'm learning more and more each day, perfecting my mind, my body, and my aim. Scythe Goddard is proud of my progress. Someday I hope I can repay him, and give him what he deserves in return for all he's done for me. From the Apprentice Journal of Rowan Damish.